Lord, thank you for this morning, for this gathering. Thank you for what you are set to do to add to us. Lord, as we gather this morning, let there be a release of knowledge and wisdom to move your work from whatever level we are today to the next level. King of kings, Lord of lords, we ask that the Holy Spirit will direct this morning. We yield this platform to you, Father. We ask, O oh God of heaven, that you will impart. Let this morning be a morning of impartation. That will be a blessing to your work, glory to you, and blessings to us. Lord, use your son and as many as have been prepared to bless us this morning mightily for us. Mm. You are the praise because you are God who hear and answer prayers. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. God bless you. You're good. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody now so that um, when it's time for you, us to contribute individually, you can unmute yourself and then you will speak. Amen. I want to start by welcoming all of us again to this wonderful session which the Lord himself has directed. I can keep on saying the Lord gave me the vision for the open pulpit. It was in the last year. It was as if God knew what was coming. And when I look at the state of the church all over the world, following the conversion of Benihim, who has taught the principle of sowing and seeding for years, who now came back to say he taught in error. And then following, following many other messages we hear all over the place, particularly in Africa, that's focused only mainly on prosperity. Also following the attack we see on church, on doctrines, on leaders, my people of the world, I felt challenged that those of us who are Christians should also use the social media for effectiveness to glorify the name of the Lord. If you check the open pulpit on YouTube, on Facebook, on our website, theopenpulpit.org, you see the amount of work that God has enabled us to do in two months. And then that's possible because of support of people like you. Next year, I'll be 70, to the glory of God. And I vow to myself that I will not let any particular ministry or platform hinder the best of my output in this kingdom. So that's why I started this, so that by next year, the open pulpit will have gained enough foundation of roots to keep us busy. Let me also quickly add that we call it the open pulpit because it will welcome, it will welcome contribution with other pastors, other ministries, where we can share pulpits together, we can learn together, because we know that when we go to heaven, the issue will not be the, this is of the apostolic or this is the Anglican, this is of the regime. No, the church of God. Amen. Amen. So I plan to do this regularly on a monthly basis, apart from how busy we have been on the, on the website on YouTube. The YouTube for now is following three systems of operation. Number one, we do what we call talk show, where we bring people together to discuss topical issues, to, to discuss things that are relevant to Christian life. Then we also focus on the personality profile. And I'm only waiting for the, the ban on travels to be lifted before we summon some of you here <laughs> to Los Angeles to come and talk your own, God helping us. And finally, there are some preachings or teachings that I released. That's not that more than 18 months, 18 minutes or 15 minutes that we post all over the place. Amen. Now, for this morning, like we posted, I want to share on operational excellence in ministry. And with your permission, we are going to, I'm going to be able to share the screen so that you can follow me as I teach. 
I will appreciate that you write your questions and make your notes on the chat platform so that Pastor Andrew Famogu can collect all those questions. And if you have contribution also, just write your name there that I have a contribution. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can hear me, let me see you wave to the Lord. Glory be to God for your lives. Amen. And I appreciate you. God bless you really good. Now I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and then go into the, into the teaching straight away. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay. I'm trying to okay. Can you see my screen? I can't see your faces now. It's coming up, sir. It's coming up. Amen. So you, you could see the main thing that talks about operational excellence in ministry, right? No, yes, sir. Sharing is paused. Bring your share window to the front. Uh, just give me one moment. Okay. So your share screen is paused. Okay. Uh, give me a moment, please. Let me go back to the beginning and see what we can do. I really want, because if I don't share this screen, um, we don't get the best advantage of what God wants us to do. Amen. Can you still hear me? Are you still with me, guys? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. Okay, I'm back to Adamala screen now. I see that many people have joined us. Glory be to God. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. You can see my screen now? Very well, sir. Good. With the open page that says uh, Operational Excellence in Ministry. Yes, sir. Glory be to God. OK. The topic of today is based on the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. I am not going to read that, but I'm going to make reference to that the scriptures straight away as we continue. Amen. So we begin by making some basic definitions. When we talk about operational excellence in ministry, we want to find out what does operational mean. Operational means ability to function or ability to be of use. And I believe that's our ministry, all of us. Operational also means pertaining to operations or an operation. 
When we're talking about function, only the living can function. So my prayer is that you will live to function in Jesus' name, even at this difficult time. Amen. Amen. How about excellence? So before I go to excellence, operation is talking about controlling divine tasks. And what do divine tasks do? Divine tasks deliver from death. So we pastors and ministers, our work is to deliver people from death. But whoever must deliver anybody from death must be alive by himself. That's one of the reasons why God has preserved our life so far in this corona situation. Are you guys hearing my voice? Yes, sir. Glory be to God. Excellence. Excellence is talking about the fact or state of excelling. A state of attaining superiority. A state of attaining eminence. So excellence is talking about excellent quality or excellent feature. Like I keep on saying, before the Lord releases us to this world, it makes sure that we are champions, that we are excellent people. And that's why God made sure that when we were deposited in our mother's womb, the sperm that he reached towards the egg, the first one, the champion, that won over millions, was the one that entered the egg and then the door was closed. You are that person. So God created you as a champion. So when we're talking about ministry, we want to define ministry as the service, the functions, or profession of a minister of religion. It's also talking about the, the body or class of ministers of religion, clergy, etc. When you put all, all those definitions together, then we say that operational excellence in ministry is talking about performing ministerial duties with excellence. It means achieving desired results according to the one who commissioned us. Many of us seem to have forgotten that the person who commissioned us has a standard of performance that is expected from us. And that's why we are, we, are, we are doing this kind of training. So when God gave us assignments, going back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16, we have to define the assignment God gave, God gave us as responsibilities. And for this teaching today, I'm going to focus only on four revelations. The assignment God gave us was very specific, as we see in Ephesians 4, 11. He says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Those were the responsibility. And the purpose of giving those responsibilities were clearly defined. The purpose, number one, was aimed at perfecting of the saints. Perfecting means to make perfect, that is to conform absolutely to the description or definition of the master. Perfecting of the saints. And who are the saints? Saints are persons of great holiness, of great virtue, and of great benevolence. Saints are created to be like our Father who created us. And the purpose also was for the work of the ministry. When we talk about work, we're talking about productive or operative activity. You see, in engineering or in science, we say that if you're exerting a force to move a wall, you'll be sweating. You may even be sweating blood for as long as that wall has not moved an inch, the work of God mm -hmm. is zero. Yep. That, that's why we define work as force applied times the distance moved. So if you're in the ministry, and you yourself have not grown spiritually, and if you you are not growing spiritually, and your church is not expanding both in width and in depth, then one has to be a bit concerned about the work we say we are doing for the work of the ministry. The ministry is talking about the service functions or profession of a minister of religion or of a worker in any church. That's what ministry stands for. Number three, the purpose. 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. This we see in Ephesians 4, 12 and 15. What do we mean by edifying the body of Christ? We're talking about to instruct and to encourage the body of Christ, to direct the body of Christ, to benefit, to motivate, to profit, to promote, to uplift, to engage positively the body of Christ. That is what we are supposed to do, to be doing. Now, moving on to Revelation number three, the process and style of operation was defined clearly. He said, by speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Ephesians 4, 12 and 15. What do you mean by speaking? Speaking, to communicate vocally, to converse, to deliver an address, to make a statement of attestation, to pray or prophesy. And what are you supposed to prophesy? The truth. The truth is defined only by the word of God. No other thing. So when pastors or ministers go to the pulpit and we mix the truth with embellishment <laughs> so that um, we will be sound authentic, you lose the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit does not operate in lies or we exaggerate or we give give testimonies that do not glorify God, then we miss what God actually wants us to achieve. I have a bonus revelation I want to mention to us here. And what is that bonus revelation? The truth makes us grow up in him. In other words, the truth makes us become like Jesus Christ. That's it. And there's consistency in the way Jesus Christ operates. Revelation number four. There's a vision we need to define. And what is the future? The vision that we see from God's instruction according to Ephesians 4, 13. We're supposed to achieve unity of the faith. We're supposed to acquire the knowledge of the Son of God. We are supposed to gradually achieve perfection in him. We are supposed to attain unto the measure of the stature of his fullness. When we're talking about achieving the unity of the faith, we are talking about oneness. We are talking about absence of diversity. We are talking about uniformity in character. So that we don't talk of the apostolic, we don't talk about the redeemed, we don't talk about the Anglican. We don't talk about the Methodist, Methodist. We talk about the Church of God. And that's why I find it a bit disturbing when some ministries will say, because you cannot do this, you cannot do that, then get out of this ministry. Mm -mm. That's not the way of the Lord. Jesus Christ knew that Peter would deny him. He did not fire him. Jesus Christ knew that Thomas would doubt him. He did not fire him. Jesus Christ knew that Judas would betray him. He did not fire him. Because every role anybody is playing in this world is so that the scriptures can be fulfilled. So excellence is precipitated on the vision. Let me go further now to talk about drivers of a vision. The vision has stand on two legs. And those two legs are mission and passion. We talk about mission. What's a mission? Well, let me go back and talk about the vision. The vision is for us to evolve a platform that will take us from this level to the next level. The vision is about seeing the invisible. <laughs> and those who are able to see the invisible are able to achieve the impossible. So excellent work is precipitated on vision. It takes a visionary to manifest a work of excellence. Yeah. 
Now talking about vision, it's important to mention that vision itself stands on mission and passion on two legs. What is mission? Mission clearly defines your objectives. So if your objective is to raise millionaires in your church, then keep on preaching to them prosperity message. They will get it, but it may lead them to hell. Whereas the objective of your creation and your gifting in Christ Jesus are those things we're talking about. When we talk about passion, passion is talking about compelling emotion, total commitment, unyielding effort. The unyielding effort you apply to giving to a given task, and your unyielding effort must propagate the truth. But these days, many pastors, many ministers, because of uh, promotion, they become political. Because of lack of security or because of another ambition, we close our eyes to the truth. And that's why, to my mind, it appears that the church is losing control. I'm not one of the people who say the church has lost control because if the church has lost control, none of us will be alive today. <laughs> But I see this coronavirus thing as a wake up call from the Almighty God. Because what he expects what he expects of us is to occupy until he comes. Are we occupying? That's the question. Now let me move forward to look at what excellence really is. You see, what is excellence? Excellence is talking about fulfilling the purpose of your creation. Is somebody listening to me over there? Let me hear yes from somebody. Hello? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, sir. We're here. I'm here. God bless you. Yes, sir. Very be to God. You see, what is excellence? Moving on. Yes, sir. You are still able to read my screen, right? Yeah. Very yes, sir. yes, sir. Excellence is talking about fulfilling the purpose of your creation. The, the purpose of your creation. Many of us run into the problem of joining associations, joining groups in the church that more or less drill us for my own personal creation. So, excellence has to do with you fulfilling the purpose of your creation. It has to do with ensuring that your task is in harmony with kingdom objectives. Excellence has to do with operating the principle of inclusivity, not exclusivity, and including all, not excluding some. So the jigsaw of divine excellence is corporately achieved with other pieces. So if you have... <laughs> If you have a jigsaw, if one piece is missing, oh, that jigsaw is not perfect. And then next is talking about the work that you are best at doing. The work you can do best is the one you have been prepared for. But in churches now, we see assignments given to those who will say yes, ma, or yes, sir, who may not necessarily be qualified for that assignment. So that defeat the purpose of achievement of excellence. We have a source of excellence, brothers and sisters, that's very important. I want that essence. What is that source? God is our source of excellence. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in Athens vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and of us. And this is why God has created us in his own image. Man's image is patterned after the image of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that we can be directed from the spirit realm, even when we're not hearing what's supposed to be hearing physically. Now, we are at a stage now when we look where we need to define the truth. The other truth as it pertains to our Lord Jesus Christ. So we talk about convergence of knowledge. I'm going to rush 
in this area, but it's actually a bit deep, but I still go through it. So the convergence of our truth, the convergence of knowledge, talking about the convergence of our true knowledge of Christ. How do we know Christ? That's number one. A true knowledge of who we are in Christ is one thing to know him, which is good, but we must also know who we are in him. That's why he says, abide in me and I in you. Because when we abide in him, and he abides in us, and we bear fruits. So, the convenience of knowledge results in the manifestation of excellence. So, what are the basic knowledge that we need to talk about here? The basic, basic knowledge I'm talking about here. Number one, the total sum of what is known, that is the word. The word that is inside every minister or any minister, we guide his level of excellence in operation. So if you have zero watch, you have zero excellence, you don't achieve zero excellence. You have a little bit, a little bit, then you achieve a little bit of excellence. This is why the Bible encourages us to keep on studying to show us ourselves approved. Then we have to have serious acquaintance with facts, truths, or principles. That's operation. Then the acquaintance of familiarity gained by sight, experience, or report. That's testimony. So you can ask us, what's your actually, what's your testimony as a pastor, as a minister? Oh, we know you have made the ministry for 20 years. What's your testimony? I mean, what contribution have you been making to the growth of the body of Christ outside your own particular interest? There's something we also call awareness as a fact or circumstance. We, we call it intuition. And those are part of the empowerment that God has given us. Intuition. I'm sure many of us have experienced something that you probably think something is about to happen, but then you didn't do anything about it, and then it happens. You ah, and I thought about it too. Our basic knowledge also includes the body of fruits or facts accumulated in the course of time. We call it life mysteries. Life mysteries. Apostle Paul suffered a number of life ministries. And everyone he suffered empowered him further, increased his anointing. Now I want to move on to how do we know Christ? True knowledge of Christ and us. That's what we're talking about. We need to know Christ, then we need to know our position with him. Who are we in Christ? So there's something you call declarative knowledge. And that's talking about knowledge of basic facts concerning us as sons of God. I, I don't want to defer to myself again as man of God. Because I believe in the year 2014, God elevated me from being a man of God to a son of God. So you need to know, you need to say that I'm the apple of his eyes, Zechariah 2 8. I am appointed by God, John 15 16. If you know you are in Christ Jesus, rules and regulations of the rulers of synagogue will not move you, will not affect you, <laughs> will not make you compromise at all. If you know that you are the apple of God's eyes, you will not mix yourself with other fruits that are getting rotten. So that you don't get rotten. Now, if we talk about procedural knowledge, it is talking about knowledge of how the processes of doing things. We call it know-how knowledge. Romans eight twenty nine says, "I am becoming conformed to Christ," and I'm sure many of us who probably have learned lessons from this coronavirus. Is doing to the world. I'm sure I'll keep on asking yourself, Father, what's going on? Father, where am I? Who are really am I? Am I okay? And present knowledge, I'm becoming a mature person. Honestly, if I tell you the amount of growth I've encountered oh, because of coronavirus alone, you'd be amazed. Even though a lot of you call me Daddy Papa 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 
Pastor Papura, regional pastor, president of this and that and everything. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that this corona thing has taught me what I didn't know in 10 years. We also talk about tacit knowledge, knowledge of insights, intuition, and inspiration. I, you say, when I talk about tacit knowledge, you say, I'm baptized into Christ. First Corinthians 12 15. Once I'm baptized into Christ, Christ died and is resurrected. Therefore, I'm not dying again. Somebody asked me one, in my church one day when we were doing um, Rebatize someone. He said, Pastor, can you die for your wife? And my wife was sitting beside me. And I couldn't lie. And I said, Please, please help me now. <laughs> help me answer this question. <laughs> Police, please said, Tell them that since Christ died and rose, nobody needs to die again. Hallelujah. Maybe my wife clapped for me. So, fear not, ministers of God. Your promotion may be delayed. It may be cancelled. You may be expelled from one ministry to another ministry. No one thing. That you are already baptized into Christ. So nothing can take or remove from you. And that you are blood bought. <laughs> Not just the blood of uh, any animal. Blood of Jesus. Now, the next thing I want to talk, to, to talk about, about true knowledge of Christ and us, is what we call explicit knowledge. This is transmittable knowledge in coded language. For example, you get up and say, I'm authorized over the devil. Hey, look, 9 1. You know the devil? The devil has been in existence for over 6,000 years. But that's the truth. You are authorized over the devil. And you are circumcised spiritually, Colossians 2 11. So that's what's happened. Tonight, I, in preparing for this thing, I slept late. I didn't sleep until about 2 a.m. But around 3 30, I had a dream. I didn't know what the dream was about. And I found myself in the dream saying, The blood of Jesus resists you. The name of Jesus resists you. I know that I was saying it loud. And my wife woke me up. He said, What's going on? <laughs> I said, I'm exercising my authority over the devil. For as long as you are circumcised spiritually, according to Colossians 2 11, you are home. Now we talk about process knowledge, the knowledge of how something works. How does something work? I am calm. Philippians 4 6. I'm continually with God. Psalm 73 23. When you are provoked, I keep on telling people that the answer to some of these questions, when you have issues or problems or challenges, it's not about resigning, it's not about, it's not about quitting. It's not, except the Lord specifically tells you to quit. No, you don't, do, you don't quit, you don't quit. You stay, you stand on your ground of truthfulness, of integrity, and you may suffer for it, but invariably, God will vindicate you. So if all you need to do is remain calm. If your wife annoys you, remain calm. If your supervisor abuses you, remain calm. Even when you notice a discrimination against you, remain calm. When the police stops you to ask a question, you, may, you know that his hands already on his gun, remain calm. Because you have the confidence that you are continually with God. There's something called concept knowledge. That's talking about knowledge of present situation with past experiences. You're able to conceptualize how you're going to move, how you are going to walk in him when you remember how you got to where you are now. And then you know that you and I, we are confident of answers to prayers. No minister, no pastor will say that God has not answer his prayer. Even sometimes when you request something from God and God is silent, that is an answer. <laughs> and then one other thing, conceptually, I'm confident it will never leave me. It will start in part to six. Because you are, it is what you are doing. 
If you are doing your own work, it's a different thing entirely. But it is the work of God that you are doing. So it will never leave you or forsake you. So now, for the people that God has kept under us, what do we have to do? We have to form a pastoral perspective about every soul under us. And the pastoral perspective of each person in the congregation is formed from Christ's perspective of his sheep. You don't, you don't hurt the sheep of Christ. You don't offend the sheep of Christ. You don't starve the sheep of Christ. You don't deal with the sheep of Christ anyhow. So the revelation we gain from here will teach us how to serve the sheep of Christ at a required level of excellence. Now, I need to let us know how we are empowered, how we are connected. I need to let us know about evolution of our excellence. There are patterns to evolution of excellence. We are connected. We are not left alone. I wish you could see the connecting invisible cord that links you to the Father. It, it begins from Father, the Creator, as we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 28. And before Christ came, our Father dealt with the children of God in those days, as we see in the Old Testament, directly, more or less. If we appear to some, we appear to Abraham. He will speak to some. He will summon one. He will summon one. He will summon Moses to meet him on the mountain. And God keep on doing that. But despite that, man continued to sin. And Lord said, oh, these people now. God help me. What am I going to do? Oh, yeah. Son, do this, do this assignment for me. So Christ came. I read that in Ephesians 4, 7 to 24. He came as a redeemer. And when Christ finished his own assignment, he said, you people, you, need go, you are going to need help. <laughs> After I'm gone, I'm going to release unto you the Holy Spirit. And the one thing that, 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 that I love so much about the release of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is like Jesus Christ multiplied in every one of us. It's by the Holy Spirit that you and I become little Jesus is all over the place. See, Jesus was trekking and walking in some areas. Those of you who have gone with me with, with Israel, we've seen the place where Jesus Christ went. But now, Jesus Christ is all over the place by the power of the Holy Spirit. So now, we have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. So the next person at that level is you and me, man. We are the performer. As we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. First Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. So now, with all these, what are our past pastoral perspective? Acts 20, verse 20 tells us that we are shepherds of his flock. We are shepherds of his flock. You know, we are also sheep under him, Jesus Christ, but we are shepherds of his flock. We are officers of his flock. So how do we see our flock? Then maybe if we if we see a flock in the right perspective, be able to treat them the way Jesus Christ Himself would treat them. Number one, our flock they are sons and daughters of God, just like you and I. So when General Vasya says, "I am your father," that General Vasya is a son of God. Yes, it's your spiritual father. But that does not make you less than a son of God also. <laughs> because the Bible does not talk about grandsons of God. Mm -mm. It doesn't. And you need to recognize that you are also a son of God directly because you'll be accountable for whatever you do or whatever you say or the way you run, the way you run your ministry. You'll be accountable. If anybody drops dead now and you get to heaven, they're not going to say, let's wait for a general verse here. We'll come and bear witness about his word. No, judgment is immediate. 
So you need to look at your footlock as they are saints in God, in Christ also. They are saints in Christ also. You have to treat them with respect. You have to handle them with care. Your, your, your flock is, they are also sheep of his pastor. And just like you, they are students of the word. We emphasize students of the word because we know that they are also growing. We are supposed to be growing. The only difference is that you grow faster other than them. All of us, we are shepherds of his flock. Is that who are, who, are, who are blessed enough to lead? Then you see your flock as family of the father. If you see your flock as a family of the father, you'll be very careful of the way you handle them. Let me give you an example. The Bible says if there's a conflict between you and somebody in the church, say call him and have a dialogue with him. If he doesn't listen, call one or two witnesses. Have a conversation with them and give him. If he doesn't listen, call the elders. Call the pastor. If he doesn't listen, what the Bible says, say, let him be. Leave him alone. He didn't say, send him out of the church. Mm -mm. So let him be. So that when the Bible says, let him be, God is saying, hand him over to me. <laughs> now also, you see your flock as witnesses to the gospel. And people witness from the experience that they get. You see, also have to see your flock as the army of the Lord. So you are a general that 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 loses his members of his army, loses the recruits and things like that, weakens his own strength. Brothers and sisters, I've taught this one before. Excellence may have two appearances. There's gold, there's gold plated. The difference will always be clear. God is not mocked. John 7.24, John 7.24 admonishes us not to judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous, righteous judgment. <laughs> One day, uh, the Lord was telling me to say something in the church. He said, go tell your general overseer this particular message. I said, no, I won't do it. God said, why would you do it? I said, because my church, they listen to only the people who are big churches. God just kept quiet. He didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. A year later, the Lord gave me there was in our church this particular building, but uh, well, we call it we call it um, a cathedral, and people began to move in. Church so began to grow, and the Lord came back after one year. The Lord said, "Okay, now, so are you going to do what I asked you to do?" I said, "Yes, sir." And I was really darling. The Lord said, "If you don't do it, I will kill you, boy. Oh boy, I did it all." So when, when, when you are really, when you allow yourself to be who God has created you to be in him, it will empower you to a level that will shock you. I was talking about difference between gold and gold plated. The ego, you can call it gold. The vulture, gold plated. <laughs> Because the eagle feeds on live animals. The vulture feeds on dead animals and feeds also on poison. 
So when we're talking about gold, gold is gold on the inside. Gold is purified with fire. The edge of gold are sharp gold. If you look at gold printed, look at the edges. You begin to see the material that it is originally. Gold is never corroded, which means who you are in Christ Jesus should not be corroded. You are the sun. You are, you are the salt and light of the world, so the Bible says. Gold does not come cheap. Gold is more of quality than quantity. So what that one is saying is that it does, don't bother yourself if you appear to be the only one or if you are in the minority. For as long as you are with God, you are the majority. So we're not talking about quality here. We're not talking about quantity, we're talking about quality. So the gathering of millions of people does not necessarily mean the presence of God. Sometimes it's a function of how desperate the people are. But with God is bad such gathering, of course not. God, God knows that those who are who are trying to use all kind of power to gather people together, and they, they actually raise the dead, yes. God said at the end, they come to me. He tell them, it depart from me. You are a profitable servant. I know you not. So let me begin to conclude now. Now I want to talk about five values of personal priority that every child of God who is a minister to follow. Number one, commitment to kingdom culture. Commitment to kingdom, kingdom culture. And the question is, who is the slide, sir? Eh? The, the slide is not moving on my own uh, device. Sorry to badge in. Ah, it's moving here. I don't know what I can well, it's, <laughs> it's moving here. Don't worry, we are recording this. We will send it to you after the whole recording. Okay. So Thank we're talking you, about sir. five values of personal priority. Commitment to kingdom culture. What is kingdom culture? Love unconditionally. Love the unlovable. Cast your bread onto the waters. <laughs> Pray for your enemy. So the prayer of enemy die. And you are keeping your focus on the particular human being. You are going against the scriptures. Commitment to pastor integrity. Job 4 6. Job, 4, Job chapter 4, verse 6 says, The integrity of your ways is your hope. Hmm. That's very deep. And God shepherds us according to integrity of our hearts. Psalm 78, verse 72. Thirst for spiritfulness. In some of these things I'm teaching you, these five values of personal priority, I learned under Pastor Jack Hayford of Church of the Way. I'm a student. I'm a student of pastoral of his pastoral um, pastoral nurture. Now, thirst for spiritfulness. Acts thirteen fifty two. Acts. 1352, feeling of the Holy Spirit is accompanied with joyful feeling. So when you go around looking as if you are the one that's solving the, 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 the problem of the world, it shows that uh, the Holy Spirit probably is uh, departed from your life. You need to impact. If you're the one that does the work and you're looking tired and discouraged and uh, heavy hearted and everything, eh, maybe you are doing the work by yourself. <laughs> Your pastor priority should also include undiluted intimacy with Christ. These people do make mistake of thinking that it's only when they pray or they fast they are, they are, they are intimate with Christ. No. First of all, you have to study the word. And number two, you have to let him know who you really are. You don't have to pretend to him. He knows who you are. You don't have to preach when you don't feel like preaching. Because you are the pastor, does not mean that you should be the one that preaches every Sunday. So you have to distribute the assignment. But before you distribute the assignment, 
you have to train your people. And after training them, you have to gradually, more or less, supervise the way they do the work. Through what we call delegation. Delegation means you assign responsibility, you keep your eyes on, but you keep your hands off. Now, another priority that you need to have to be sensitive to is sensitivity and attentiveness to family. <laughs> your family, your family. If you cannot take care of your family, forget about doing the job of God. Forget about taking care of the family of Christ. That's why we have to make sure at all times that even when you are insulted by your spouse, you take it in good faith as unto the Lord. You see, I have this equation being a mathematician that says spirituality minus spirit is ritualty. <laughs> you know, initially the, the Israelites were governed by spirits of ritualities, many of them detailed in the book of Leviticus. The overriding work of the spirit was made manifest on the day of Pentecost. I remember the first time I went to the upper room in Israel. Something happened that I will never forget. Something fantastic. A good example. Ritualities is the past term of Pharisees and Sadducees. They dwell on the system. They dwell on the law of the land. They forget about spiritual things. They forget that what binds us together is fundamentally is the unseen love of the Father. When you not bring documents as a rule of engagement, then you are missing completely. But when you are in your routine, your rituals is powered by the Holy Spirit. Then you have spirituality, which means newness has come. The Bible says, Behold, I make all things new. Thank you, Lord. Let me tell you five values for your flock. You have to create intercessory mindset in your flock. And does that, how does this happen? You have to intercede for them. You have to intercede for one another. And you have to engage them in this intercession. I remember when I used to go to the camp, I wasn't really good at praying. But I used to sit beside the late Pastor Esco, Pastor Esco Inform. The first time I sat by him, oh my God, when it was time to pray, oh my God, that I prayed. I said, oh, right, if Esco can pray like this, I better begin to sit next to him. I begin to pray also. I mean, those were the days when we believed that things were really happening. Then you have to develop your people for leadership. You have to develop your people for leadership. If you find out what will happen to you now, if you, sometimes I don't feel like going to church, I may not go to church. In my church, the glory of God, we have, in fact, we do not have enough time for pastors who can preach. I just told my minister, I said, those of you who have series to preach, let me know. Series means you can preach for a whole month, digging deep. You have to develop your people. Then you have to let people know that the knowledge of the kingdom is real, even though it's invisible. And that's why Psalm 91 11 says, We are surrounded by ministering angels. For he shall give his angel charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Then you need to continue to teach your people the spirit of generosity and faithfulness in giving. Now, this works in one or two dimensions. Spirit of generosity. You have to give by yourself as a leader, as a minister, even though you don't have sufficient. Even though you don't have enough. And if you cannot give, make sure that what you are taking is not at the expense of the ministry. 
It's not at the expense of the church. And people want to acquire power. This is how power comes. Then you must let your people know that they are entitled to fullness of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can occupy them fully. So, to achieve all those, what should be our focus at every service? <laughs> Number one, prophetic word from God. Your people want to hear, God says the Lord. And if you, are, you, you, you don't hear what says the Lord, what says the Lord is right in the scriptures. If you say, brothers and sisters, the Lord says there's somebody here whose days of sorrows are over. People will say amen. As a prophetic word from the Lord for somebody. Somebody is waiting to hear that. The Lord says somebody is here who will never beg or borrow. Amen. The Bible says it's the man of God. For you to profit in all things, even as your soul prospers. Then you must create atmosphere of joy. And that comes with qualitative praise. You must teach people worship in truth and spirit, brokenness. You see, when you worship and you enjoy the music and you enjoy the sound and nothing happens, you are not there. But when, you're, when you people worship in truth and spirit and there's brokenness, and people begin to cry. Sometimes you don't need to preach any message again. It doesn't matter how beautiful your auditorium may be. It doesn't matter the expensiveness of your equipment. And once there is no brokenness, you are not there. So if you go to many of these big churches, you see clamor. Yes. You see opulence. Yes. You see wealth. But there's absence of brokenness which means eventually the church is a social gathering. Mm -mm. The anointing in you is too much for you to preside over a social gathering. Then at every service, there has to be transformation to Christ-mindedness, which means divine touch. And that's where we say, okay, we were pointing to people who want to who want to either give their life or want to renew the redemption of sin. Class A22, mute your phone. Going on now, curricular improvement in partition. Now, curricular in, 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 in improvement has to be so many things. If it is for you in the church to teach people what to be better their life in the world, go ahead and teach it. If it is possible for you to do leadership principles, teach your people leadership principles or civic responsibility, go, go ahead and teach it. But make sure that that does not take away the time you use to preach the gospel. So excellence in the final analysis, as I, as I conclude, ability to express faith. That's what excellence brings. Ability to express fellowship, genuine fellowship. You don't have members of your church who will pay you, annoy you, who will change the kind of person that you are, that you find your place at death. No, love the unlovable. And ability to encounter transformation, but that transformation has to begin with you. If you're not changing yourself, you can't change anybody. And I believe to evangelize. If you cannot evangelize physically, environment, uh, environmentally, your lifestyle can evangelize to people. And then finally, I believe to remain saved. So finally, I end with Philippians 4, 8. Say, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good reports, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, may this all on these things. I want you to know that this coronavirus is challenging all of us, children of God. And you're not too young. You're not too, 
junior in the system not to be possibly impacted. Thank you, guys. God bless you, really good. Can we take questions now? Let me go back to the screen. Amen. Okay, we are back to see our faces now. Share, you are still there. Thank you. Patricia, you are there. God bless you. Sister Big, you are still with us. Salas Ajimi Jai. God bless you. Olawale. God bless you. Really good. Um, all right now. So, sure that's just my teaching. And then um, I need, where is Pastor Andrew? Do we have any questions? Yeah, yes, sir. the only question that was online, simply, you, I think you've answered it already. So would you be able to email the slides to us? That was the question that was posted. And I believe you answered that already. Yes, I'm going to post this on the Open Puppet website. I'm also post, I'm going to post the material also on the Open Puppet website. I'm going to put, save this one and put it on YouTube, also on Facebook. But I need you to please visit our website regularly because we've put a lot of materials there. I also need you to help me share You did mention uh, subscribe also, sir. That's very, very important. I, when people, I, when you post. I also need you to help me subscribe. For now, I tell you guys. Pastor Austin uh, from Abuja, God bless you, good. How is Papa? How is Papa Jack? <laughs> How is Papa go on? Please give Papa go on, my love. We talk, we almost ending now. Now, listen, folks, I'm begging you to help me share this thing. You will see that I don't charge fee for this teaching. That's what God has told me to do, and it's free. I know that the time will come when I'm able to get corporate sponsorship. That's what I require for some of the things we are doing. But the part you need to play is anytime we send out invitation, be part of it, Make your contribution. That's why it's called the open pulpit. So now we have till 10.30, about 20, that's 17 minutes to 20 minutes. For you to, to, to have contribution. But contribution will also help me, help me grow. Amen. So we need to have contribution. You need to help me go to the um, to YouTube, to Facebook, and then uh, actively engage and participate in what you are seeing there. Amen. So now we have open forum. Anybody has any question or any contribution? Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Daddy. We appreciate you. And uh, we need more of you on this platform, sir. May the Lord continue to increase you in Jesus' name. I just wanted to say we appreciate you, sir. Who is speaking? Yes, Oh, Pastor Bolaji, God bless you, sir. Samsung SM N95OU. Code. Yes, sir. God bless you, my brother. Bless, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other contribution, question? Pastor Samadhi Lucy. <laughs> Second Samuel. <laughs> Second Samuel, talk to me. We're in Israel just um, last year, 2019. Talk to me, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I thought it was uh, a very great presentation. The content is uh, very helpful. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time to develop the content uh, that you have shared with us today. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any questions or anything at this point. I'm just here to listen and, and tap into whatever grace that is available on this platform, sir. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thanks. I'm encouraged, but I, I want to learn. You can't just, all of you can't just say, I've come to learn and you go away and you leave me <laughs> a bit dry. <laughs> I have a question, sir. Yes, sir. Pastor Silas, shoot. Yeah. 
uh, thank you so much, sir. I'm, I'm indeed very grateful to God, and I thank God for His grace over your life. And, where is where um, are you speaking from, sir? I'm in Nigeria, sir. Okay. I'm okay. speaking from yes, sir. My network has been um, a bit fusy, so but there's an aspect, and uh, I'm really very happy about what we have learned today. Some of which are not entirely new to me but it is very refreshing in that i have been listening to you from any possible every possible format you know over the years mm. amen now th this this there's one let me shake the table a bit now you said that you spoke about handling crisis in the church um where you say don't if you if you report, you talk to the elders and so on, you just leave that, let him be. What do you do to a, a very recastrant and troublesome member of your local assembly? You know, do you just let him be or how do you throw out somebody who is very troublesome? Before you, before you answer that question, sir, thank you, thank you, Pastor, for that question. Uh, sorry, I, I think you have opened something that uh, I was going to take it up with him personally, but let me, let me, let me ask, let me add to that so that uh, uh, he can help us to answer this question. And scriptural, scripturally speaking, we saw the case of Ananias and Sapphira, who were troublesome members of the body, and they were cut off. In New York City, we had a parish many years ago, I want to say 15 years ago, we had a parish of the Redeemed Christian Church of God in New York City. And um, we started it from our parish at the time. And uh, there was uh, a deacon who troubled the pastor too much, too much. And because we, so at some point, uh, our pastor had to call the pastor that was sent out to that parish because the deacon was just troublesome, troublesome. So they called him and said, okay, how do we resolve this? Then the pastor says, told the pastor who sent him out, the pastor of the new parish told the pastor who sent him out, who Daddy Fafawura knows very well. And he said, so what is the solution here? The pastor says, well, Oga, you are my pastor. But well, you are going to have to decide who you want to pastor this parish. Is it that you ask this guy to leave this church or I will leave for him? So my question is, because it, it's, it's pretty interesting. I know God, uh, sometimes we are emo with this, with emotional, we need to balance these emotions and say, okay, if there is somebody that needs to go, do you keep him at the expense of the other members of the church? You know, so sir, please clarify, clarify that question. I brought those two examples from the Bible and the one in New York. I don't know if you remember, we started the parish uh, at the time uh, and, and uh, that was an experience. So if you could clarify that, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. You can, you can, let me first let you know that I learned by my personal experience, number one, in all my, 21, 25 years of pastoring, I've never expelled anybody from the church. Never. The only thing that I did, which was early this year or last year, was to tell somebody that I withdraw myself from being your pastor. I told the person, I said, I withdraw my, I inspire myself. I resign by myself from being your pastor. And I did that because that person was capable of bringing a lot of things that we distract, that we pollute the other members. So because I withdrew myself from that person's pastor, the grace has finished for me. So there's nothing I'm seeing on the pulpit that will benefit, him, benefit, benefit the person. The person stopped coming. After some time, the person showed up in church about six weeks later. I got down from repeat. I went to greet the person. 
I want to greet the person. So which means I allowed and kind of opened up. All I was expecting was for the person to come and say, okay, pastor, well, I have learned my lessons. I'm sorry. No apology, no nothing. So I, 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 I withdrew myself back. And the person now started begin to use tire in interacting with other members of the church because we have various WhatsApp group that they form by themselves to which the pastor is not an administrator. So immediately I made a law that every WhatsApp group that's existing in the church, the pastor has to be an administrator. I promise I will not interfere in their programs. I never did. But when I see that somebody is like this and the person is abusing the information that he or she is getting from the church, I quickly extract him or her from that WhatsApp group. When the, the, the law will look at your heart, what has happened in my experience so far, and I can mention about five cases, that when somebody is no longer working the way you're supposed to be working with my team, the person himself resigns. <laughs> Invariably, the person himself resigns. Then when it comes to planting of churches, as somebody more. There are many things I have done and comes to planting of churches that give it the opportunity I will never do again. We plant churches because of expansion, but we, don't, we plant churches without training people that are supposed to be leading those churches that are planting. And so sometimes affliction comes from within the church as a way of God, as a way of God, you know, a training <laughs> the new pastor as a way of challenging that new pastor to grow. And I said that if your church operates a system of discipline or a system of managing such crisis, then that's, that's it. And that's why someone like me will find difficulty in having my personal ministry. But even me, myself, I can fire myself one day. So if you are if you are a regional pastor, no, let's you are just a pastor and you have a problem, your area pastor is there to help you solve the problem, to take your over the responsibility. If you are an area pastor, your other senior pastor is there, your coordinator is there. If you are a coordinator, your provincial pastor is there. If your provincial pastor, <laughs> your regional pastor is there. If you're a regional pastor, your general overseer is there. If your general overseer, God is there. But I, I have carried the pain of rebellion and abuse and difficulty in the church to see that it led more to distraction from my own side. And then one Lord God now, sorry, even among the church, when somebody is catacross like that, there will be somebody he, that, that can talk to him. Otherwise, if you look beyond him, there are other obscene people who are encouraging him, who are empowering him, unseen people. Those are part of the challenges of ministry. I will need you guys to contribute to this because um, my experience cannot be the all garden experience as we have. Pastor Bilo. Omit yourself, sir. Um, this is really, really interesting, sir. Um, I really appreciate uh, my pastoral path. I learned, uh, I learned a lot from you. Um, uh, the few times I spent uh, with you in uh, Jesus Embassy, um, because I've discovered that one thing you do is that you are very, very uh, flexible when it comes to giving opportunity to talents and gifts to be expressed. I know one thing I also discovered is that a lot of people take that for granted and abuse the opportunity and uh, try to probably they want to outshine the, the presiding uh, pastor, you know, and all that, you know. But for instance, I thank God for the fact that I learned some patience and some virtues from you because uh, this is my first, uh, 
my first experience taking over a parish, an existing parish. All the while I've been pastoring by the grace of God in our CCG, it's always been that um, I am sent to go start a parish from the scratch, you know. And, um, you know, when you, when you come into a place that has been existing, doesn't matter how bad or good it is, you definitely have people who will oppose you. Mm. Who we want to like kind of uh, run you down and uh, try to get you to do uh, what pleases them. And um, I've had a series of uh, cases where I've had uh, almost like two or three families living as a result of uh, like what our pastor just said about uh, somebody, a member who is just stubborn and um, rebellious and uh, disrespectful, as it were, you know, and um, it wasn't that maybe I told them to leave. The only thing I did was that I just kept my focus. I wasn't moved. I wasn't distracted. And this, I learned from you, sir. I'm not saying it because you are here, but I have to let you know that. You know, I wasn't distracted. I was focused on the mission and on the vision. And by so doing, I believe God himself dealt with them because uh, they got frustrated along the line. And they left. You know, and people started, like what you said, Pastor, that if you look at the very way, there are some unseen forces, unseen uh, group of people and, that are aiding them. <laughs> you know, uh, truly, well, that, uh, that was discovered. You know, people who are on ground, who are like kind of aiding them to do what they are doing, supporting them to push on, you know, and um, God started working out things and all that. Uh, God started exposing a lot of uh, uh, misbehaviors and all that. The way God actually embarrassed certain people by the way they exposed themselves publicly in their acts, you know, and, um, and they left. I'm talking about here in America. I wouldn't want to mention Nigeria because, I mean, there are a lot of cases, you know, where I have to, um, um, somebody in the ministerial team had to report to the, uh, provincial pastor on my behalf. Of course, I never did report. Did report. I mean, they reported on my behalf, and such person was uh, asked to come to report back to the base, and um, just like the military, report back to the base, and uh, that was taken care of. But here in America, I just kept my focus straight. I never wanted to like uh, confront anyone. I was not distracted, and I, like I said, I learned that from you. I must say that. And, uh, and it's, it's, it doesn't end there, it's still on, even as I speak to you now. <laughs> because I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was gonna ask you a question about, you know, when you have somebody who, um, I mean, you, you talk about training people and um, delegating. I want in delegation, you have to keep your eyes open on them and your hands off, you know? I, I, that sunk into me. Your eyes on them or your hands off. And you know, you come into a situation where somebody who claims to know so much will not want to follow the guidelines. You know, when you have, for instance, the word for the month, and you told all the ministers, okay, uh, get your um, message to align with the vision for the month. And it doesn't have to be exactly as it is and also keep to time and all that. But you have a, a fellow who just kept on acting out and acting out and acting out and will disrespect school, you know, disrespectful in every, in every, in every angle. And, all, and will not show up for some meetings and just show up on a Sunday service and he wants to be part of things that are going on and everything and all that. So, I, sorry, I, I just jumped into that. I want, I want Pastor to help, help out in this because this is a present case. <laughs> and Pastor, I, Pastor, I don't want to, Pastor, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to act on the redeemed principles or maybe the Christian principle of uh, dealing with such people because they will think because I am not Nigerian. You know, I'm not Nigerian and that's why you're doing this to me. So I don't want to walk in that sentiment. I want to just follow the guidelines of the Holy Spirit or how he wants things done. 
not being tribalistic or whatever it is, you know, because this fellow is not in Nigeria. So, Pastor, I don't know what you're going to say about that. I, so, sorry, I, I jump, I, I made some uh, contribution. I also jump into <laughs> uh, throwing some, uh, some questions out. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. Pastor, before, practical. Pastor, before I respond, this is Taiwo Shinsu. Taiwo, okay, Pastor Taiwo, God bless you, sir. I just want to read the scripture to us because um, there is no way we can be pastors and we won't have interesting people. I call them interesting people in our parishes. I have a couple I'm dealing with right now. But one of the things that, helps, uh, that I use that helps me to, to guide me really, uh, and I was also share a couple of my pastors, is James chapter one from verse two. James one verse two. It says, consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking nothing. Amen. Um, Amen. There is also the scripture that says there is no fear in love. You know, uh, um, at a, you know, yeah. Um, at the point in time, I had someone coming to my church. That is a pastor. Has been pastoring well before I started to pastor. He relocated to to the city I live. And started attending the church, and uh, because I just wanted to kind of recognize the ability that I can add value, every time he had an opportunity to get to go on the pulpit, he turns it into a deliverance service. I am not called into deliverance ministry. So, but I won't say anything. And at a particular point in time, I hope uh, you all can hear me. And this, uh, you'll find that you, you know, also ties into what we are saying. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so on a particular occasion, my wife and I traveled, and I, a lot of the members had come to me to say, Pastor, you are not comfortable with this person and all of that. So I said, okay. On this particular occasion, my wife and I traveled, and I said, okay, can you please take the service this Sunday? Mm. And um, they agreed to take the service. But we had to leave the program that we went to early because my daughter had uh, had an issue that we had to come back to. So we drove back to our city. And then my wife appeared in church. I went to minister in another church, only to find out that uh, it wasn't the man that was preaching. It was his wife that was preaching. I never said a word. I heard. And my wife called me and said, I thought you said so, so, and so should preach. Why is his wife preaching? As soon as my wife entered, you know, the, the wife was not comfortable. Anyway, I didn't say a word. I never asked him why. I just said, God, I need you to help me to deal with this matter. Just like a pastor said, alluded to earlier, he left on his own violation. Without my so what I try to enjoin all you know uh, 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 I have a case I'm dealing with right now and I'm almost at the tip of saying I don't want you to come to church again but I find that it is not for me to decide who comes it is for God <laughs> to to do the cleansing if there is a need that requires especially if maybe somewhere along the line, I have been one of the people that has actually encouraged a person to become who they are. I created the monster. So what am I saying? In situation and in circumstances where we have interesting people in church, the focus should come back to us and say, what would Jesus do in this situation? And there is nowhere in the Bible that says that Jesus expelled a person from under his ministry. The Bible said he always went about doing good. It is difficult, it is hard. 
But if you take it back to God, because that's the final person you can report to whoever it is that is giving you trouble to uh, call the person, call elders, call pastor, after pastor, the spiritual owner of the church is God. Take the person to, church, to, to God, like pastor has said, and ask for grace. Thank you so you much. You can refocus, you can redirect, but you actually, maybe what is happening is actually testing your own patience to see whether or not what would you do in this situation. And that's just what, what you know. What I wanted, what I wanted to add. All of us at different times. <laughs> we've been. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. God bless you, sir. Where are you speaking from? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you, my brother. Um, let, let me quickly say this. Thank you. All your contributions are fantastic. That's why you have this kind of forum. That's why I call it the open pulpit, where we can learn from each other. I pastor a church in Ibadan. That, that that we planted and that grew to 1,800 people in three years. 1,800 people in three years. That church now has become two provinces in Nigeria. Over 300 churches. It was when I got to America that even though I was pastoring a church of 1,800 people successfully, I was a training pastor. <laughs> So my training actually started again at another level as a pastor when I go to America, over about 12, 13, 14 people. The Bible says love covers the multitude of sin. That's number one. Then number two, Jesus Christ knew, like I said during the teaching, he knew Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, I mean, Judas would be the one that would betray him. He knew that uh, Peter, very abrasive, always doing what he's not sent to do. Cut somebody's ear. Well, it was not straight to do that. But Jesus Christ did not. He said, I pray for you. The devil has come to sift you. Or I pray for you. Now, <coughs> going further in all these things, I asked myself, you are lucky to know those who are troublesome in your church. God showed them to you so that you can make a redemption of their souls as much as possible. But there are other people that are known unknown to you who are your serious enemies who are dining and whining with you. Who behind you, they do other things. Those are the people that you really, really need to worry about. And God will help you, help you to handle all of them. You know, when you have pastors or ministers, let me tell you something what happened to ministers that happened to me when I was growing up as a minister. Every minister has his sermon somewhere. And they're waiting to jump upon <laughs> and time to call them. So it doesn't matter whatever you think you are doing, the series you are doing, or the vision you are having at a particular time. It is someone that they are prepared, that they are coming to bring to the pulpit. So that's why somebody do see himself as an evangelist. Even when you are doing something else in a particular season, we go and speak to someone you want to preach. And what's my attitude? My attitude is simple. I will say, maybe that's what God wants. And that's it. And once I say, maybe that's what God wants, if that's not what God wants, God will show me that that's what, that's what he doesn't want. Then number two, I always lay the principle of how we're going to operate as a team. So I won't call a minister behind to say you did this, that shouldn't happen. No, it's a matter of how we want to operate as a team. I make sure that anybody I want to admonish, I admonish the person in love in place of members of the team. Like we all learn together by so doing. Amen. I didn't mean this thing to last more than 90 minutes, but you're already 1040. And uh, but I'm enjoying it. I don't know, but if you're enjoying it, you want other questions and contributions. Silas. Yeah. Yes, Silas. Any other yeah. questions or contributions? Yeah, that's uh, good for today. Thank you very much, sir. And thanks to the other distinguished contributors. I'm grateful, sir. Thank you, sir. Pastor Andrew, anything?
All right. Um, I, I want to say thank you, sir, and I really thank God for introducing, I don't know, for meeting you, sir. I appreciate you as a father. And I, I'm enjoying this, and uh, I really love it. When you mentioned the sheep of Christ, I, I have been thinking about uh, a possible teaching on that subject. I want, I've heard long time ago, when I was still back in England, on the deep type of sheep. And uh, I'm trying to collate because I think the people I have around me, some of them are black sheep, uh, brown sheep, or goats. Well, uh, yeah, maybe that too. I don't know. But I see that they're all sheep. I don't have goats right now. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. So I was just trying to say that uh, maybe in future, if you can teach us on the different types of sheep that, uh, that exist in the ministry, then the sheep, are, I believe that they are all good. They have their quality. Some can be arrogant, maybe red or brown sheep, but it has its own quality that may be useful later on, even though they make be like uh, uh, members that irritate the pastor as a type of sheep. There will be other type of sheep that also help pastor in a certain area. So I want to, I'm really, really, really interested, uh, maybe in future, I know it's not a topic for today, sir. Okay, thank you so much. That's a beautiful thing. Like I said, we must teach each other. So um, I give you an assignment. Yes, sir. Go and prepare a 15 minute message of the type of sheep you can find in the Church of Christ. So next time you are meeting, you take the first 15 minutes to teach that. Okay, sir. Because you just go back and study all those things. Do your research. Look at the scriptures. Don't come and preach to us. Come and discuss with us. There's a difference between preaching and discussing. Come and spend 15 minutes to... That's why we call it the open pulpit. Come and discuss with us for 15 minutes what you have found out about sheep. <laughs> Amen. All right, sir. All right. That should not frighten other people from making suggestions because we are all here to learn together. The topic for, let me finish. Um, Sister Patricia, Pastor Patricia, you are welcome in Jesus' name. I see your face. Um, now your face has disappeared. Do you have anything to contribute? Yeah, no, I really learned from everything you said and it's really helpful. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, like you said about uh, stubborn uh, uh, people in the church, uh, so, uh, interesting people in the church, like you said. But, uh, yeah, that one is good, you know, like Jesus didn't, when, even Jesus, when Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him, he didn't just say, you are the devil, get out of my church. You know, he's the Christ, he knew everybody's mind. What he did, he still, ate with him and did everything with him. And at the right time, he himself was the one that went to kill him, hang himself. Mm. So at such so, so situation, when we have people like that in the church, we just hand them over to God. You know? mm. And it's even good for somebody to display their own, that, like you said, than uh, the secret ones, people that you can't even tell their mind. Some people are, such ones are even dangerous. So all we do, we just keep praying that God will help us. And if there is anyone that uh, the devil is trying to use against the ministry, and that God should just, in his own way, deal with them. And we pray for God to touch them and take away everything that's going to distract them from the focus of the kingdom. Thank you. Amen. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, Pastor B, before you leave, you have any word for us? Maybe she's left. Well, uh, Pastor Sheye. I'm, I'm good, sir. Whatever good. Amen. Glory be to God. Okay, brothers and sisters, I think at this point we have to end this wonderful discussion. And I've been blessed. I thank you. Like I said, the next date will be August 15, 2020. We will do a flyer. It's usually the third Saturday in the month. 
August 1st is the first Saturday, followed by August 8th. August 15th is the third, is the third um, Saturday. And the, the, the theme for that one is Secrets of Prophecies. Secrets of Prophecies. So like we said, the people want to hear God says the Lord. <laughs> Amen. So Secrets of Prophecies is what we do next. And that's after Pastor Andrew Famogu presents for 15 minutes a uh, make a presentation on the type of ships we have in Church of God. Amen. Glory be to God. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, Pastor Andrew, you want to close up with a prayer, please? Our Father.